Johnny and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business? We can help. Again, breaking news, Jake Bertanen charged with sexual assault by the VPD. All of our guests today, including Farhan, uh, standing by, brought to you by Optic Foliar. It is uh, Thursday. The only lights on spray with no damage and no burning to your plant leaves, plant efficiency, nutrition, and results all combined into a single solution for all stages of growth and safe to use on flowers. Spray it, see it. Belief it. That's Optic Foliar. Visit this made in BC company online at opticfoliar.ca. As we bring in Farhan Lalji uh, from TSN. Thanks for doing this, sir. How are you? I'm good, fellas. How are you guys doing? Very oh, well. Great. Uh, uh, this just broke, Farhan. So if I'm putting you on the spot and if you don't want to talk about it, I would uh, understand. But uh, Jake for tan and charged uh, with sexual uh, assault. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, first of all, your thoughts go to the victim, right? I yep. mean, that's the first and foremost uh, priority. And you wish her uh, well in her recovery and the struggles that she's dealing with going through this entire process. Because when you go through an investigation and, and potentially a trial, it's not just what happened immediately. It's just having to relive it over and over. So your first thoughts absolutely go with her. And you hope she's doing as well as can be expected in all of this. Um, as far as Jake is concerned, uh, just... You know, so many things wrong, right? When it mm -hmm. came to Jake Bertanen during his time with the Canucks, not nearly as significant as what's based around this charge, right? I mean, that, you know, hockey doesn't compare to that. But mm -hmm. from a hockey perspective, the reason we're talking about it is because he's a former Canuck and a player that played his minor hockey and, and grew up in this area. And certainly, um, you know, we, we questioned his character along the way as it related to hockey and then whether or not there were maturity issues and, and things like that that eventually extended into – a pattern of behavior that uh, potentially took it this far. You know, I don't want to connect those dots necessarily, yeah. but uh, certainly his hockey career in Vancouver is marked by underachievement on every level, right? And then to have this just uh, um, go beyond the arena and into the courts and uh, something that's so much more serious, you just hate to see it for anybody. Again, thoughts with the victim. Okay, uh, Farhan, tough uh, term. We're going to take it. Should Canuck fans be, and this is the first time we've had you on this week, should Canuck fans be confident in the group Jim Rutherford has assembled? Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think just the look of this management team and, and also, you know, we've been really critical of ownership over the years. And in fairness, ownership is going to allow Jim Rutherford to build out this organization uh, at a level that we haven't seen, certainly in the, the Jim Benning era, right? Just in terms of resources that are going to be allowed to be dedicated to this, the way they're going to be able to operate in a real professional manner. I mean, you know, you, certainly uh, the the feedback that we've been given on um, uh, Patrick Alvin has been very, very strong in terms of his ability to, to take this next step into a general manager and take the experiences he's gleaned to this point. But just when you think of what they've assembled around him and Emily Castonguay earlier this week and their ability to, to add, you know, on the performance side, add on the analytics side, uh, just the management team, the way it's going to be built out. I think it's going to be a, a professionally run organization with a lot of educated voices at the table as opposed to maybe a bit of an echo chamber previously. So I, I think this is a, a real positive. I think if you're a Canuck fan, uh, I think you feel like the franchise and organization is in the right hands because I think we haven't felt that for the last five or six years now. Okay, we're going to get the football in a bit, but I, I'm going to hit you with something else. Um, that's uh, that's edgy, very edgy. You had some strong <laughs> words regarding the Jacob Panetta, Jordan Subban I incident as a man of color yourself. I is there room here for benefit of doubt? Yeah, I don't know that there is, and that was the whole point of my tweet. It wasn't a defense of Jacob Panetta because I knew there was more information that was mm. going to come out, and you know the league has suspended him, and even in their suspension and their statement, uh, you know, the, the, they said that, look, this is not about intent. It's about, you know, just it, it was an insensitive gesture at the time. And, you know, whether or not Jacob Panetta has been made an example or not, uh, you know, it, it, let's say he has. Let's say that Jacob Panetta didn't intend for that to be racist, but the league decided to make an example out of him. It's hmm. not entirely wrong, right? I don't have a criticism with that, and I wasn't trying to defend. It just felt like in that moment, Panetta's explanation for what had happened was plausible and for me I just want to be able to say what if and I want to be able to have the discussion 
And that's the bigger thing, because right now on race issues, and I've had this discussion with people of race, and, they, and many of them tend to agree that it, it, it's gone you know, in a direction we don't want it to necessarily go. And maybe it has to go to that direction in order to come back to the right median. But right now, when something like this happens, the instant reaction is to pile on. That's the expectation, right? It's not just about being not racist. It's about being anti-racist, right? And, and there's some truth to that and some positive to that. But I, I think that the fact that you can't have a discussion about what actually did or didn't happen here, that's the biggest problem I have. And, you know, um, I hope Jacob Panetta was telling the truth, not saying he should have, shouldn't have been punished mm -hmm. or that it still wasn't insensitive. I hope he was telling the truth only because I hope there was one less racist act out in society. You there know you what go. I mean? It's not there about you. him yeah. or about Subban. It's just less racism. That's all we want, right? I mean, and, and Rick will tell you, we've we've both been exposed to it at various times in our careers, uh, in our upbringing. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and be a race baiter. I haven't experienced a lot of it in my life, but the few moments that I have really, really resonate with me, right? And um, yeah, like I said, I, I, I would just like there to be some more dialogue. I'm going to move over to football where we talked to Lions GM Neil McAvoy yesterday. Uh, the big question right now, Farhan, is Brian Burnham. Can they re-sign him, the Lions, or is he going to hit the market in here, what, about 10 days? Yeah, you know what? I, I, I'm optimistic. I think there's a pretty good chance, and I think the Lions, uh, they, they understand the value that Burnham brings, not just as a receiver and a guy that makes contested catches, but in the community, in the locker room. You know, he's one of the few faces that we recognize here, and especially in the absence of Michael Riley, you know, you want to continue a little bit of that. And he can still play. He's 31 years old. He's not 35, right? Like, the guy can still play. So I, I think they're going to pay one more receiver significantly. So whether that's Burnham, whether that's uh, a Kenny Lawler from Winnipeg, if he makes it to free agency or something like that, who knows? I mean, it could be both. But I do think my understanding is from, from where the contract talks began initially, they began in a pretty good place. So I think there's some optimism that it can get done. But he's going to be sought after, right? There are teams that need playmakers. Edmonton needs a playmaker. Ottawa needs multiple playmakers. There's going to be teams interested in Brian Burnham. So the date is not February 9th. It's that, that J January 30th window for tampering. Um, you hope it can get done before that because then everybody's going to say, look, we'll give you this and this and this, and then it makes it harder to get him signed. All right. Uh, to give us your picks on the NFL this weekend. Who's going to make it to the Super Bowl? You know, my preseason picks – to make it to the Super Bowl at the start of September were Kansas City and the Rams. Mm. So I'm going to go with that. Now, I've wavered along the way, right? I, you know, there, there were times even in these playoffs, I picked Buffalo to win last week. I picked uh, Arizona to beat the Rams earlier. Um, but uh, mm. that said, I do think both those teams are going to get through their matchups this weekend. Um, playing Cincinnati has, has beaten Kansas City, but that was in Cincinnati. Beating them at Arrowhead is a different animal. And I just think the way that defense is playing right now uh, is better and – and when you look at Cincinnati's offensive line, I think that's a problem. That group gave up nine sacks, and that group is a problem. You're not going to win a, a low-scoring game. You're going to have to score points if you're Cincinnati to keep up, and I don't think they're going to be able to. And I, I don't think Jamar Chase will take this game over the way he did the last time the two teams played. Meanwhile, on the other side, I just don't see a way the Rams are going to lose three times in this season to San Francisco. They've been much more clean the last couple of weeks as far as Matthew Stafford is concerned. Yes, there were some fumbles in the last game, but I think Stafford's going to protect the ball. Uh, and if that happens, I mean, they've got to give away the game, right? When they yeah, played yeah, in week 18, yeah. they were up 17 points. They gave the game away. I don't think that's happening again. I'm not a Jimmy G believer. I think the Rams are going to win this game. Okay, and very quickly, uh, Farhan, again, first time we've talked to you uh, since uh, last week. Chiefs over the Bills in overtime, oh. 25 points in the final two minutes of regulation. Was that one of, and some people saying maybe the greatest game in NFL history? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, quite frankly, for me, you know, like my, my measuring stick in the NFL was that 81 uh, Dolphins Chargers game, right? The Kellen Winslow game, the division. Oh, that playoff. great game. You know, you, so you go back to that, and then for me, football all told, it was the college football national championship when Vince Young and Texas beat Matt Leinart, Reggie Bush, and USC, yeah. right, at the Rose yeah. Bowl. Um, this, to me, when you consider the stakes involved, and guys, don't ever view a game that had a great finish as a great game, right? Because, yeah, we yeah. want to focus on the 25 uh, points in the last two minutes. This was a great game from start to finish, Right, it was two epic quarterbacks. It was a game with minimal, Tremendous. you know, no turnovers, minimal penalties. All of this, start to finish, an incredible, incredible game for me. 
trying to avoid the recency bias when you put all the stakes in, best game I've ever seen. Yeah. 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 Brian, uh, thanks so much. We'll talk to you about the NFL overtime rules uh, at, a, at another time. We're out of time right now. We can't go overtime. Our rules say we can't, but thanks so much for this. <laughs> You only go overtime when I'm about to come up in the next segment. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll, we'll talk overtime next time around. <laughs> Thanks, my friend. Thanks, guys.